Hello everyone, my name is Anthony Medock and I'm with the Department of Emergency Medicine. I'd like to welcome you to the UCSD Emergency Ultrasound Lecture Series and today we're going to be talking about the trauma exam, specifically the extended fast exam. This is a general overview of what we're going to be talking about in this presentation. We're going to start with a brief introduction. We're going to go over some of the relevant anatomy so you understand why we look in the particular places that we do when we're looking for free fluid in the abdomen, for example. Then we're going to spend a fair amount of time on the technique. Now the basic FAST exam uh, essentially is consisting of four views. And then several years back there were some new views added, the so-called extended views, and that is how we get the term the extended FAST exam. So we're going to go over both the basic four view exam and then the extended portions of the exam as well. We're going to go over some pretty cool slides uh, that will demonstrate some pathology. And then we're going to conclude with some pearls, pitfalls, and tips. So by way of introduction, trauma was one of the earliest accepted applications of point of care ultrasound in the emergency department in the United States. And FAST exam, for those of you that are wondering, simply stands for Focused Assessment with Sonography for Trauma. The emergency department ultrasound applications have expanded dramatically since the 1990s when the FAST exam was initially developed and accepted by both emergency physicians and trauma surgeons. Ultrasound, as you can imagine, is an excellent imaging modality for the trauma patient. It's ideal in many regards. It can be done at the bedside, it's very quick, it's non-invasive, and there's few risks. There's no contrast material, you don't need to have intravenous access. It's ideal in many regards. However, just like any laboratory test or any imaging modality, there are limitations. It's not perfect. And it's very important if you're going to be a user and a uh, performer of these ultrasound exams that you know when it's warranted and when it can potentially have shortcomings. And so it's important to recognize and remember those. First of all, of course, whenever we talk about ultrasound uh, examinations, people often refer to the quote-unquote operator dependence, and that's certainly true. Um, however, as part of this lecture series and as part of your training in residency, you're going to get better and overcome some of that operator dependence because as one is more novice, of course, there is a possibility to miss some pathology. However, even in experienced hands, small amounts of fluid may go unnoticed. It's going to take at least two to 300 milliliters of free fluid in the peritoneum before you're likely to actually see it on ultrasound, which may seem like a lot when you think about that's pretty much one unit of blood. So it, it has to be a fair amount of fluid to actually be present before you're actually going to visualize it on this ultrasound exam, and that's important to know. It also does not visualize the retroperitoneum. So if there is potentially a concern for a retroperitoneal pathology, then the FAST exam or the ultrasound uh, modality may not be ideal for your patient. And then lastly, you may see solid organ injury, but you often may not. So if you have a significant concern for evaluation for solid organ injury, you're going to need to get a CT scan because ultrasound alone is inadequate. The FAST exam has many applications. It's designed to detect peritoneal, pericardial, or pleural fluid in the setting of thoracoabdominal trauma, blunt trauma. It's great for the evaluation of pregnant trauma victims because obviously you like to avoid any ionizing radiation if at all possible. And it's also excellent for detection of pneumothorax in the setting of trauma patients. This particular scanning protocol became widely accepted by trauma surgeons decades ago and therefore that was its kind of first way to get heavily incorporated into ATLS as well as into many emergency departments across the country. Now, there are many different ways that you can incorporate the information you get from this particular ultrasound exam, the FAST exam, into your medical decision making. This is just simply one algorithm that is an example of how it may be used. And of course, there are many variations of this scanning protocol and how it's used across the world. If, for example, you have a patient that is a blunt trauma victim, they present to your emergency department and you perform the extended FAST exam. Essentially, you're going to have three outcomes. If the exam is equivocal, in other words, you're not certain if you see free fluid or not, or if you're certain you do not see free fluid, then the exam does not have quite as much impact in terms of your clinical course. If the patient is stable, then you can continue doing serial examinations or perhaps a CT scan. If they're unstable, you can consider exploratory laparoscopy 
or perhaps in some institutions even doing diagnostic peritoneal lavage, even though this really isn't done very frequently any longer because of ultrasound. Where ultrasound can really have a big impact is in the setting where you do an extended fast exam for your blunt trauma victim and you detect free fluid. Because now, you simply ask yourself, is the patient stable or not? If they're stable, then you can consider going to get a CT scan to better delineate the anatomy and the extent of injury. But most importantly, if the patient is unstable and you have positive free fluid on your exam, then you know the outcome and the disposition of this patient. Call your trauma surgeon, get to the operating room. And it's this whole algorithm of blunt trauma patient, extended fast exam, positive free fluid, and unstable go directly to the operating room. And because of the institution of scanning protocols for trauma like the FAST exam, the time to get to the operating room is less, and this translates to better patient care, better outcomes. So when we think about the anatomy as to why and how we do this exam, the shape of the peritoneum provides dependent areas when the patient is supine. So essentially, when you're laying flat on your back on a gurney, for example, there are going to be a couple different spaces anatomically, or a few different spaces rather, where fluid is going to preferentially collect. One of those is the hepatorenal space, which you may often hear referred to as Morrison's pouch. The other place that fluid is going to accumulate is in the perisplenic space, as well as in the rectovesical or rectouterine pouches. Now the site of fluid accumulation will depend on multiple things. It will depend on the position of the patient, the source of bleeding, whether or not the patient has ever had abdominal surgery before, whether it's and uh, the, the patient is male or female, uterine et cetera, et cetera. pouches but are going general, to be the highest the yield and most sensitive areas to look for small amounts of free fluid. And therefore, these are the places we're going to look with the ultrasound. So. Overview of the anatomy. This is just a netter plate. Uh, realize here that this is looking from the top down. So this is not like looking in a CT scan. This is a basically an axial image looking down. This is obviously the patient's left. This is the patient's right. You can see their kidneys here. And if we highlight these two particular areas, here is your perisplenic space. Here is your hepatorenal space. So if the patient is actually bleeding from an injury to their liver, the, the fluid is going to collect oftentimes here in this hepatorenal space, or it'll often collect here in this perisplenic space. And hopefully, as you can see, as this patient is essentially laying on their back, why that would be the case, because this area and this area are the most dependent areas of the peritoneum when the patient's lying on their back. And so those are two of the spots we're gonna look for fluid on ultrasound, the Morrison's pouch and perisplenic area. Now, if we look at this, sagittal slice through a female pelvis, this demonstrates another of the most dependent areas in the pelvis, specifically in the female pelvis, and that would be the recto-uterine pouch, or sometimes called the pouch of Douglas, and you can see here as well. This area here is where fluid will also preferentially collect in the female pelvis. Now, in terms of how we do the exam, you want to make sure that you have the right equipment. Essentially, what you're going to need is uh, the, select the proper probe. You're not going to want to use the linear probe that you might use for vascular or procedural type um, exams. You're going to want to use a convex, microconvex, or phased array probe. In our department, most of the machines all have a phased array transducer. One or two of them have a, a, a curvilinear transducer, but generally not all of them do. You want the patient to be in the supine position and ideally, you want to make sure you have the patient positioned optimally. So if you're looking in the hepatorenal space or around the spleen, you want to place the patient in Trimdellenberg because that is going to increase your sensitivity by getting any small amounts of fluid to collect up around the diaphragm, the liver, and the spleen. When you're looking in the bladder and the pelvis, you want to put the patient in reverse Trimdellenberg for that very same reason so that any fluid in the pelvis is going to collect in the uh, pelvic area around the bladder and in the rectovesical or rectouterine pouch. Now, how you do the exam. They call it the FAST exam. It's kind of a cute name because the idea is it's supposed to be rapid and quick. But at the same time, you have to be very complete, and so it does take some practice. You are going to be surveying the peritoneal and the pericardial and the thoracic space. The whole exam should take less than three minutes to complete, and it can be done in tandem during patient resuscitation in the emergency department or in the trauma bay. So the basic FAST exam, as opposed to the extended exam, contains four views. 
The first view is the perihepatic or the Morrison's pouch view where you're going to be looking here in the right flank in these spots here between the ribs. So this is going to be view one. The second space you're going to look at is the perisplenic area here in the left flank as you can be illustrated right here trying to get between the ribs. The third spot is going to be looking in the pelvis in the recto vesicle, recto uterine pouches right here and that will involve doing a longitudinal view through the bladder and a transverse view through the bladder. So there's basically two views when you're looking uh, in the pelvis. And then lastly you have the pericardial view which is going to be right here in the sub xiphoid area. So basically you've got one, two, three, and four. Those are your four views of the basic FAST exam. Okay, let's talk about the first view, Morrison's pouch. This is going to visualize fluid in the hepatorenal and the right pleural space. The way you're going to place the transducer is you're going to place the transducer in the mid-axillary line in the right flank between the lower ribs. You want to place the orientation marker towards the head in this orientation towards the head and you want to adjust or rotate the probe to optimize the view. You're going to have issues trying to get through ribs, especially with a curvilinear transducer like this one is rather large. So you may need to rotate it slightly so that you're aiming obliquely through the ribs. That way you can avoid rib shadowing. And this is an example of what you'll see in the near field towards the top of the screen. You're going to see liver, then you can see kidney, and then I really want you to pay attention to this area here. This white or hyperechoic structure that you see here going up and down is the patient's right hemidiaphragm. And as the patient's breathing, you can see the diaphragm excursion going up and going down during inspiration and expiration. And one of the really important things you want to notice is that you're generally going to get something called mirroring artifact on both sides of the diaphragm, such that it almost looks like you have liver on both sides of the diaphragm, even though this is actually lung. But lung, of course, is mostly air, and ultrasound doesn't really like air terribly much, so essentially, what you're going to end up getting is you get an artifact called mirroring artifact where it looks as though you have liver parenchyma on both sides of the diaphragm and that's actually normal and what you expect to see. When you don't see that mirroring artifact above the diaphragm, above the diaphragm on this side in the pleural cavity, then you should be wary that there is fluid, whether that be pleural effusion, hemothorax, etc. So you should expect to see mirroring artifact above the diaphragm. And in this case you do. This is normal. Taking away the labels, you can get another look at it there. So again, liver, kidney, diaphragm, pleural cavity. And again, if you look at the space between liver and kidney, they abut each other. There's a bright white line of a little bit of perinephric fat, but there's no anechoic or black stripe of fluid between them. That's normal. Okay, now let's talk about the perisplenic view. This is a bit more difficult than looking at the right upper quadrant view simply because the spleen in the normal condition is going to be much smaller than the liver and so essentially you have a smaller acoustic window through which you can look into the peritoneum to look for fluid. So you have to be a little bit more skilled when you're trying to get a left upper quadrant view but I'm sure you'll be able to do it. It just takes a little bit of practice. One important difference between getting a view of the uh, splenorenal space is you want to make sure you position the transducer at the posterior axillary line, not the mid axillary line. So whereas on the right upper quadrant, you are placing the probe maybe up here, for example. Here, we're going to be placing the probe almost such that your fingertips or your knuckles are touching the bed. So you want to be a bit more posterior and align the transducer in the posterior axillary line at the lower costal margin when you're looking at the left upper quadrant. And as usual, you want to have the probe orientation marker pointing towards the patient's head. So for the perisplenic view, once you have properly placed a transducer and you're in that posterior axillary line, you may need to subtly rotate or adjust your transducer position to obtain a full view, including the diaphragm. And that's very important because unlike in the right upper quadrant view, fluid is likely to accumulate in the subphrenic or subdiaphragmatic space as opposed to in the splenorenal space alone. So you need to make sure you get a good view of that entire diaphragm. To do that, you're likely going to need to adjust your probe position a little bit and also you can ask the patient to take in a deep breath and hold it and by doing that they're going to bring their diaphragms down and bring a bit more of the diaphragm and the spleen into view. Another tip on this uh, particular view for the left upper quadrant, the stomach is something that can occasionally throw people off because if you're too far anterior, 
uh, in the uh, uh, on the in the mid axillary line, for example, you may actually see part of the stomach in your view, and that can be mistaken for free fluid or perhaps with a mass that's abnormal. When in fact, it's just normal anatomy. You want to make sure you're very posterior and essentially have your hand that's holding the probe resting with your knuckles on the bed such that you're very posterior and then you don't have to worry about accidentally visualizing the stomach from that left upper quadrant view. So here's an example of a normal perisplenic view. So you have the spleen, the diaphragm, that curved hyperechoic structure that's kind of going up and down and you can see that splenorenal space and again you can see a little bit of hyperechoic material in between the two and that is simply perinephric fat Again, above the diaphragm, this side of the diaphragm, you see a little bit of that mirroring artifact, which is normal. So it's very important to see the diaphragm because oftentimes in the left upper quadrant view, fluid is gonna be hiding right here, as opposed to just between the spleen and the kidney. So you wanna make sure you get a good view of that subphrenic, subdiaphragmatic space. All right, now let's go on to view three, looking in the pelvis. One of the most dependent portions of the peritoneal cavity is actually in the pelvis. So you want to make sure that the patient has a full bladder to use as an acoustic window. If the patient has a Foley catheter or if they just voided, you're not going to have a very good window into the pelvis and the exam will be very, very limited. Place a transducer just superior uh, to the pubic symphysis and orient the transducer transversely such that the orientation marker is pointing towards the patient's right. So with this arrowhead, the head of the arrow here represents the orientation marker will be pointing towards the patient's right. Once you've done that and you're satisfied with that view, then you're going to rotate the probe 90 degrees to obtain a longitudinal or sagittal view. The orientation marker will be pointing towards the patient's head as per typical ultrasound conventions. Then you're going to need to gently fan or rock the transducer in all directions for full visualization in both planes, in both the transverse and the longitudinal. And here's basically what you'll see. So in the transverse view, the bladder usually looks a bit more symmetric. You're going to get a little bit of what's called posterior acoustic enhancement posteriorly here, which basically just means you're going to get more echogenicity deep to the bladder. But you'll notice very importantly that although we see anechoic or black stuff within the bladder because the, ur the urine is mostly water, we don't see any anechoic signal deep to the bladder. And again, this is anterior. This is where we're placing the probe on the patient. And this is posterior. So dependent-wise, we would expect to find fluid collecting down in here, which we don't see. Then when we rotate the probe 90 degrees in our longitudinal view, this is usually what the bladder looks like. So this is cephalad towards the patient's head. This is caudal, and the patient's uh, pubic symphysis would probably be right around here. And as you can see, again, this is still anterior. This is still posterior. If we had any free fluid, we would expect it to collect down in these dependent areas of the pelvis, which we don't see. We just see a little bit of posterior acoustic enhancement and perhaps a little bit of bowel gas here. So these are two examples of normal transverse and normal longitudinal views of the bladder as part of the FAST exam. And here's a video clip. So there's the bladder. Again, it's anechoic. It's going to be black because urine is mostly water, and water fluid is going to always be black or anechoic on an ultrasound exam. And again, you can see posterior acoustic enhancement. In other words, enhanced echogenicity deep to a fluid field structure. And you see fluid within the bladder, but we see no free fluid outside of the bladder, which is exactly what we hope to find. Okay, then the fourth and final of the basic FAST exam view is a quick view around the heart or a sub xiphoid view. So you want to place the transducer in the epigastrium. The orientation marker will be oriented towards the patient's right. This is going to be contrary to when we do the cardiac exam, and we'll discuss that in a separate lecture. You want to aim the beam towards the left shoulder, like so, and angle the transducer in a nearly flat plane. Now, one tip. If you're having difficulty getting a, a good view, one thing you might do is, and it's actually a little bit counterintuitive, take your hand and your probe and actually slide it a little bit to the right, so farther away from the heart. But the reason you'll do that is so that you can incorporate more of the liver and use the liver as an acoustic window to shoot your sound beam into the chest. So if you can't get a good image in the epigastrium, slide a little bit to the patient's right. That way you can aim your sound beam through the liver parenchyma and you'll end up getting a nicer image. All right, so here's basically just a diagram demonstrating that same concept. There's the xiphoid process is going to be basically that inferior aspect of the sternum. Here's going to be your probe in that same area. You're going to have a nice flat angle uh, into the uh, body 
aim that beam up towards the left shoulder so that you get a nice view of the heart just like so. And here's a video demonstrating that same principle, nice shallow angle into the chest. Here you're gonna see a cutaway where the initially the beam is gonna go through part of the liver, so that gives you a good window. And then you slice right through the heart and get a nice four chamber view. You're gonna see a little bit of diaphragm. You see liver here. And then the first cardiac chambers you'll see is right ventricle, right atrium, left ventricle, left atrium. So again, liver, right heart, left heart. And this is pericardium. And what you see right here is pericardium abutting the diaphragm. Here is a normal subxiphoid view. And again, liver, pericardium, and diaphragm abutting one another. Right heart, specifically right ventricle, right atrium, septum, left ventricle, left atrium, and here is a bit more of the pericardium. So this bright white is pericardium right here. And later we're gonna talk about looking for pericardial effusion. And in that instance, you won't see just a tight bright white line right here. What you'll see is fluid or a black anechoic stripe collecting back here, which we don't have in this example. This is a normal subxiphoid view. Okay, so now let's talk about taking this to the next level. So the extended fast exam, otherwise known as the EFAST. So bedside ultrasound has been demonstrated to be superior to physical exam to detect free fluid in the peritoneal and pleural spaces, as well as detect occult pneumothorax. Bedside ultrasound has been shown to have greater sensitivity than supine chest x-ray to detect occult pneumothoraces. And in fact, in this instance, I don't, wouldn't necessarily say this is occult, but this is a nice example of a pneumothorax. So there you can see pneumothorax, and we can actually find that very nicely with the ultrasound. And these uh, plural views that we're going to talk about are what makes up the extended FAST exam. So thus the EFAST was born to incorporate, the idea was incorporate plural imaging in addition to the peritoneal and the cardiac imaging as a screening measure in trauma patients. It involves only two additional steps to the traditional or basic FAST exam. You're gonna scan the left and right plural spaces to look for fluid, namely hemothorax in the setting of blunt trauma. And you're also gonna scan the anterior lungs to detect pneumothoraces. Okay, let's talk about how you actually do this extended FAST exam. And let's talk about the left and right pleural spaces. So basically, you're going to be scanning the pleural spaces while you're already scanning in the right and left upper quadrants looking for free fluid around the liver or around the spleen anyway. So it's not really any extra steps. It's the same probe positioning. You're essentially just going to slide the probe a little bit cephalad, maybe one rib space, so that you can look above the diaphragm in the right flank and the left flank. And that will allow you to look for hemothorax or fluid in the chest in the setting of blunt trauma. So it really doesn't add much time or effort to the exam. Same probe, same probe positioning. You just slide up one inner space and pay a bit more attention to what's going on above the diaphragm as opposed to previously we were really only paying attention to what was going on below the diaphragm. So... Let's talk about evaluation of the pleural space a bit further. In general, as I talked about a little bit earlier, you expect to see air or scatter or what we call mirroring artifact above the diaphragm. Normally, lung is not something that you see very discreetly on ultrasound. And so as a result, above the diaphragm, what you expect to see is essentially something that looks the same as liver or spleen above the diaphragm. If you actually get anechoic signal above the diaphragm, that's abnormal. That indicates that you have fluid above the diaphragm, which in the setting of trauma would be very concerning for blood or a hemothorax. So normal right upper quadrant, you have the diaphragm, you have mirroring artifacts, so you have what looks like liver on both sides of the diaphragm. That is the normal condition. Normal left upper quadrant, so there's the pleural space, there's a diaphragm, you can see the spleen and the kidney, and again, on the plural side of things, above the diaphragm right here, you have what looks pretty similar to spleen parenchyma. You don't have a big black stripe over here. If you do, that would be abnormal. All right, so in addition to looking at the plural spaces, we're also going to evaluate for pneumothorax as part of the extended FAST exam. So 
let's talk about how you're going to evaluate the chest for traumatic pneumothorax. Remember, supine chest x-ray can miss up to 25% of pneumothoraces, so this is really something that adds a lot to the evaluation of a trauma patient. You can use either the phased array probe or the linear probe, whichever you like. Each has its advantages. There's our pneumothorax. So linear array is ideal because you're going to actually get very high resolution. You don't have very good penetration abilities to go into the chest, but that's okay. We just want to see the plural line. And so my preference is to use the linear probe. The only problem is <clears throat> you are going to, that's going to involve switching transducers because the rest of the fast exam is done with the phased array. So in the interest of being fast and being a bit more rapid with your evaluation, you can very well just leave the phased array transducer hooked up to your ultrasound machine and you can just use that for the whole exam. But if you really want to get a bit more detail and you have a few seconds to spare, you can switch over quickly to the linear probe specifically just for this part of the exam. But the rest of exam should be with the phased array um, or the curvilinear probe. So patient position is supine. You want to place a transducer in a longitudinal orientation at the midclavicular line at roughly the third or fourth intercostal space. And what you want to look for is you want to look for two ribs and adjacent pleura. And normally lung parenchyma is going to have a sliding of the parietal and visceral pleura as they abut each other. And you're also going to see occasional little hyperechoic little kind of shooting star or comet tail artifacts that are going vertically from the pleural line downwards into the far field. And that is indicative of normally aerated lung. So here is your probe position. You want to place the probe. In this case, I have the, I'm using the linear probe, but again, you can use the phased array probe as well. It's going to be placed um, on, of course, you're going to do this on both the right and the left. <clears throat> In hemithorax in the midclavicular line with the orientation marker pointing towards the patient's head. Here's a nice diagram illustrating what you're looking for and I'm going to show you a video clip in a moment but essentially what you're going to see on the video clip of the ultrasound is you're going to see a, a superior rib, an inferior rib, and then you're going to get shadowing so you're going to get a black spot deep to the rib because of course the ultrasound energy bounces back from the rib and it's not able to penetrate so as a result there is no echo, there is no return signal from the sound energy deep to the rib and so the machine is basically just going to make it all black and that's called acoustic shadowing. So you're going to look for that acoustic shadowing behind the superior and inferior rib and then it's once you've identified where the ribs are you're going to see a horizontal bright white or echogenic hyperechoic line and that is the parietal pleura. The parietal pl or the, the pleura, the parietal pleura on this side and the visceral pleura on that side. And as the parietal and visceral pleura abut each other, and as the patient breathes, you're going to see some horizontal motion, or what we call sliding, of that pleura as the patient breathes. And occasionally you're going to see little hyperechoic kind of shooting star or comet tail-like artifacts that will emanate from the pleura and shoot downwards. And these comet tail artifacts, and more importantly, this sliding so to speak, of the pleura is exactly what you look for in the setting of normally aerated lung. So here's an example. So sliding lung, you can see the two ribs with the rib shadow. So here's a rib and a shadow. Here's another rib and a shadow. And then the white line that connects the two is the pleural line. This white line right here is the pleural line. And you can't make it out, but that's comprised of the parietal and visceral pleura abutting each other and you can see this sliding motion. Just look very closely and you can see right here that there is a horizontal kind of moving back and forth and that is indicative of normally aerated lung. So let's talk about some pathology now. So let's talk about free peritoneal fluid. Free fluid is going to be black because on ultrasound fluid whether that be blood or ascites or urine or anything else for that matter anything that is fluid is going to be anechoic or black. Now remember, as I said earlier, the FAST exam can detect free fluid, but it's going to have to be at least on the order of two or 300 mils of free fluid before you're likely to see it. So again, if the patient is very early in their presentation or it's not a very vigorous bleed, you may not see anything on your initial ultrasound exam, which is all the more reason to consider serial abdominal exams and serial ultrasound exams if the patient remains hemodynamically stable. Repositioning the patient, in other words, putting them in Trendelenburg when you're looking in the right upper and left upper quadrants, or reverse Trendelenburg, which would be feet down, head up, when you're looking in the pelvis, will increase your sensitivity, because by doing so, you're gonna get any small amount of fluid to collect either superiorly by the diaphragm, or if you put them in reverse Trendelenburg, that fluid will collect inferiorly in the pelvis. So depending on 
where you're looking, you may want to put the patient in Trendelenburg or reverse Trendelenburg if the patient will tolerate it. That'll increase your sensitivity of your exam. So let's talk about and demonstrate some examples. So uh, fluid normally collects in Morrison's pouch, as we spoke about earlier when we're looking in the perihepatic area. However, the it may also be subphrenic or elsewhere. So you really want to get it a, a very comprehensive look. But in this particular example, here you're looking at liver. This is right kidney. And whereas before, they simply abutted one another with a little bit of perinephric fat in between. Here you have a big black stripe of anechoic signal, and that's indicative of perihepatic fluid, which in the setting of trauma, means you've got blood in their belly, which means they need to go to the operating room fast. Here's another example. Again, here you see the liver. Here you see the right kidney. Here you see some perinephric fat and fascia. That's normal. And here you see the diaphragm. But most importantly, what you also see is black or anechoic signal around the liver between the kidney and the liver. So this is fluid in Morrison's pouch. Now again, like I talked about previously, not all fluid in the belly is necessarily going to be blood. It all depends on the clinical context and the hemodynamic status of your patient. In this instance, this is also a perihepatic or a right upper quadrant view. Here you see liver, here you see kidney, and literally everything, the liver is swimming in fluid. There is fluid all the way around this liver, which if this was blood, this patient should be very hemodynamically unstable. So you ask yourself, is this likely to be blood? And although it's certainly possible, this would be a, a very large volume in the patient you would expect to be very hemodynamically unstable. If the patient looks like this, is you know has um, jaundice, etc., and has a long history of chronic liver disease, then you know that this isn't blood, but this is more likely to be ascites. But this is a good illustration of the point that fluid in the peritoneum is going to be black, and you can't tell if it's ascites or if it's blood. You're going to have to rely on your history, your exam, and the clinical context of your patient. All right, so now let's talk about looking in the left upper quadrant in the perisplenic area. So fluid in the left upper quadrant collects in an alternate fashion than in the right upper quadrant. In the right upper quadrant, generally fluid is going to accumulate between the liver and the kidney in that Morrison's pouch. However, in the left upper quadrant, looking around the spleen, there's an anatomic structure called the phrenico-colic ligament. And this actually restricts fluid from filling preferentially in the splenorenal space. And actually, fluid oftentimes will collect in the subphrenic space, in other words, between the spleen and the diaphragm. And you can see that here. They have fluid here between the spleen and the diaphragm up here, as well as a lesser amount in the splenorenal space. So although there is some fluid here, initially it will have started here. And once it fills up significantly, then it'll actually start to leak and spread and dissect into the splenorenal space. So that's the splenorenal recess with a small amount of fluid. And that's the subphrenic space with a lot more fluid. Another example, again, spleen, left kidney, perinephric fat, and then again, this actually looks great. The splenorenal space doesn't have much fluid in it, but here, all the way up in, in and around here is your subphrenic area, tons of fluid. All right, so where is the fluid in this clip? What you're looking at here is liver, here's diaphragm, now, do you see fluid below the diaphragm? Do you see any fluid at all? This is diaphragm. Looking below the diaphragm, I see the liver abutting the diaphragm very nicely. So there's no subphrenic fluid here. Here's the kidney. Here's perinephric fat and fascia. I don't see any fluid collecting here. But what's going on right here? So that's fluid. But that fluid is above, not below the diaphragm. So of course, fluid above the diaphragm is a pleural effusion. So when you're doing your FAST exam, you may see fluid that is not in the belly, and it may be, again, above the diaphragm, in which case you have pleural fluid as opposed to peritoneal fluid. And in the right clinical context, maybe that's a small hemothorax, or if the patient is not a trauma victim and you're looking for fluid, perhaps you've just found a pleural effusion from an occult malignancy or some other inflammatory process. So another example of a pleural effusion. So here you can see the liver, here you see diaphragm, and here you can actually see a little bit of atelectatic lung that's just kind of floating in this large collection of fluid. So again, it's very important that you notice that here's diaphragm, and this fluid collection is above the diaphragm, not below the diaphragm. So you're looking at pleural fluid as opposed to peritoneal fluid. And again, 
instead of mirror artifact, you see free fluid in the plural space. So if you don't see mirror artifact, ask yourself why, because there's probably some pathology there that you may miss if you don't look for it otherwise. Okay, what about this clip? So here we have liver, here we have kidney. What do you think? So if you highlight there where those arrows are pointing, you can actually see this bright line right here. And there's a little bit of kind of black or a little bit of kind of dark gray in between. That's just essentially um, perinephric fat and fascia and abutting the capsule that surrounds the liver. So that's a normal finding and not free fluid. But again, when in doubt, if the patient's unstable and they had a significant traumatic mechanism, you can re-examine them in 20 or 30 minutes. If the patient's bleeding, this perinephric fat and this little tiny area of kind of hypoechoic signal between the liver and the kidney will get bigger and bigger as the patient continues to bleed. But after 20 or 30 minutes, if the image looks exactly the same, then you probably are right in that it is a normal finding and it's just artifact. In this case, this is normal. This is not pathology. All right, so yet another example. So there's liver. Here is the diaphragm. And again, there's no fluid below the diaphragm, but above the diaphragm, you see a ton of fluid. And you can see probably some inflammatory changes here and some atelectatic lung kind of just going, flipping around back and forth within that big collection of fluid. So this is a pleural effusion. All right, so where is the free fluid here? So this is looking in the left upper quadrant. This is spleen. This is diaphragm. So what do you think? So you got fluid on both sides of the diaphragm. You have both pleural fluid above the diaphragm and peritoneal fluid below the diaphragm. All right, so now let's talk about looking for free fluid in the pelvis. And it can have a variety of appearances. That's going to depend on the gender, the transducer orientation, whether you have the orientation marker pointed towards the head for a longitudinal view of the bladder or towards the patient's right, getting a transverse view of the bladder. It's also going to depend on things like, for example, again, if the patient has ever had abdominal or pelvic surgery before, because if they have adhesions, etc., that's going to divert fluid preferentially to one area or another. But in general, fluid is going to be looking like this. So in the transverse view, you're going to see some fluid collecting deep to posterior to the bladder. And in the long axis, you're going to see it again tracking along here. So this is all anechoic collection outside the bladder. This is bladder, and this is anechoic collection or fluid outside of the bladder, which you shouldn't have. And again, we're, we're essentially looking in a female is in this cul-de-sac or this recto uterine pouch right here. And in a male, the analogous space is the recto vesicle space. Either of those areas are where we're going to be looking. Okay, so when we're looking at the pelvis, here you can see the bladder in short axis. And the video clip is highlighting you've got free fluid dependent just posterior to the bladder where those arrows are pointing. Okay. And then... If we rotate 90 degrees and look at the bladder and long axis, superiorly, again, you can see this fluid collection right here outside the confines of the bladder. So there's the bladder. Here's fluid outside the bladder. This indicates free fluid in the pelvis. Here's another example. So there's the bladder. And as we fan through, you can see a large pocket of free fluid there, essentially all around the bladder. This is all fluid. This is all fluid. This is all fluid, fluid, fluid in the pelvis. All right, so now let's move on to looking for fluid around the heart, which could be pericardial effusion or hemopericardium. Hemorrhage can accumulate quickly within the pericardium, and this may lead to decreased right ventricular filling, which can ultimately culminate in cardiac tamponade. And again, fluid around the heart, just like fluid in the pelvis, is going to look black or, in ultrasound terms, anechoic, without echo. So this is a rather clear example of a large pericardial fluid collection. This is a subcostal view, so there's a little bit of liver up here at the top. Here is pericardium. Here is the right ventricle, and in between, as opposed to having the RV wall literally abutting the pericardium, you see a large anechoic collection, and that is indicative of a pericardial fluid collection, pericardial effusion, or hemopericardium, depending on the clinical context of your patient. In this instance, you can see that the fluid collection goes all the way around the heart, and it's obvious in the posterior aspect, adjacent to the left ventricle, you have a large, large collection of pericardial fluid as well. But it does make the heart very easy to distinguish and look at all the chambers, right atrium, right ventricle, 
interventricular septum, left atrium, and left ventricle. So a rather clear example of a large pericardial effusion. Here's a video clip. Not quite as obvious, but still, if you look where the star is highlighted, that is pericardial fluid. So this is your right ventricle, and normally this right ventricular wall should be abutting the pericardium, but here you have a large fluid collection that is outside of that, or within that space rather, and it wraps all the way around. So back here, you can see an anechoic fluid collection as well. So this is another example of pericardial effusion. And yet another. Again, look for an anechoic signal outside of the heart, but within the pericardium. So again, here's the pericardium here. Here's the RV and the LV, and we see fluid or a black stripe all the way around. All right, lastly, let's talk about how we assess for pneumothorax. We talked a little bit earlier about looking for sliding of the visceral and parietal pleura as they abut each other. So again, you wanna identify rib, rib, and identify that pleural line. So rib, rib, and then identify that pleural line. And I've highlighted that for you here. That's your pleural line right there. And then what you wanna do is just focus on that area and ask yourself yes or no. Do I see horizontal sliding motion across? If you do, that's indicative of normal aerated lung. If you look at this line, I don't see any horizontal sliding. The whole chest wall is moving a little bit as the patient's breathing, but this bright white line is very static, contrary to this white line where you see some horizontal sliding motion. So look at that line, and you can see that there's no sliding on this side of the screen, and this is indicative of a pneumothorax. So normal lung, again, you can identify that pleural line and you can see very clearly that you have some back and, back and forth kind of sliding horizontal motion of that parietal and visceral pleura as they abut each other. So if you see sliding, that's indicative of normal lung. Now, again, there's the pleura. And although you see chest wall movement as the patient's breathing, this horizontal white line, hypercoic line, is not really moving. There's no kind of back and forth sliding that we saw in the previous clip. So this is indicative of pneumothorax. So why no sliding when you have a pneumothorax? I get that question a lot from medical students, residents, etc. cetera. So um, let's spend a couple of minutes talking about that. So here's a really nice cartoon that demonstrates what we're looking at in terms of uh, that ultrasound image. So again, superior rib, inferior rib, acoustic shadow, acoustic shadow, the bright white line in between the two is the pleura. In this instance, in the setting of pneumothorax, for example, that's the parietal pleura. The visceral pleura is here. And in between, of course, you have air. Ultrasound doesn't like air. If you think about it this way, to have sliding, you have to have parietal pleura and visceral pleura abutting each other. And as they abut each other, and as the patient inspires and expires, that's what's gonna cause the dynamics that gives you that kind of sliding type motion. But if you have a pocket of air between the visceral and parietal pleura, then you don't have the abutting um, anatomy of the parietal and visceral pleura where they're literally on top of each other, kind of moving against each other, causing a little bit of that sliding phenomenon. If there's air in between, there is no sliding. And if there is no sliding, you're not going to get that horizontal movement back and forth that you see on the ultrasound in the normal condition. So that's essentially why you don't get sliding when you have a pneumothorax because the air prevents the visceral and parietal pleura from abutting one another and it's that abutment and movement that causes the dynamics that you see on the screen. And if you only have the parietal pleura and not the visceral, you're not going to see that sliding because there is no movement between the two that you can visualize because the air prevents that. Ultrasound does not like air and so if you have air between the two, you're not going to visualize the visceral pleura and therefore you can't get that sliding phenomenon that you see on the two-dimensional ultrasound image. All right, what if you're still unsure about sliding in a particular case where you see the pleural line and you're not sure if you see sliding or not? That's okay, that does happen sometimes. You can try using something called M mode. The first thing you need to do is figure out how to start M mode on your machine. On our Zanara machines in the emergency department, there is a button beneath the keyboard that basically has an M on it. So if you hit that button, you're gonna put the machine into what's called M mode or motion mode. And basically what motion mode does is you're taking one line 
right here. You're normally going to get a B mode image on the top, and then you're going to basically get to take a look at what this one piezoelectric crystal is seeing over time. And when you do that, then you're going to plot over time. So you're going to plot what this one crystal is seeing in terms of ultrasound signal over this horizontal axis of time. And when you do that, what you're going to get when you're looking at a lung in the normal condition is a pattern that looks like this. Keep in mind that the top half of this screen corresponds to the top half of this screen. The bottom half of this screen corresponds to the bottom half of this screen. So as you can imagine, this is the plural line about halfway down. So this is your plural line right here. So that bright white signal is your plural line. And above the plural line, over time, chest and muscle and the musculoskeletal structures of the chest wall are going to be looking exactly the same from an ultrasound standpoint. And so you're going to get that very linear kind of pattern. However, below the plural line over here, this is all alveoli that are aerated, inflating or deflating, depending on if the patient is breathing in or breathing out. And so if an alveolus is filled with air, it's going to give one echogenic signal. And if it's empty and during exhalation, then it's going to give a different signal. So over time, normally aerated lung is going to give a speckled, very dynamic type of pattern, whereas musculoskeletal structures, or collapsed lung for that matter, is going to look exactly the same over time. So when you get what's called a seashore sign, where you basically get kind of a sandy-like pattern and then kind of a nice serene ocean kind of a, a wave-like pattern up on top, then that is indicative of normally aerated lung. So this is what normal lung looks like on M mode. All right, so again, sometimes people refer to this as the, the seashore sign. Again, sandy pattern at the bottom, a linear pattern on the top. Imagine yourself kind of relaxing on the beach, looking out of a nice, at a nice quiet sea. So this is no motion in the chest wall. This is analogous to the waves. And this is the positive motion lung beach kind of pattern that you're gonna get on M mode. Now, in the setting of pneumothorax, this is called kind of a quote-unquote barcode sign, where essentially, below the pleural line, you don't have any aeration of lung, and so as a result, you get a linear pattern top to bottom. You don't get that nice sandy pattern down here. You get the same linear pattern all the way across because non-aerated lung is going to have no change in signal over time, so it looks very static and linear and not that scattered sandy pattern that we expect to see of aerated lung. So this is a pattern on M mode that's concerning for pneumothorax. So again, comparing them side by side, you want to engage M mode, put your cursor and, and line it right on the, um, uh, the plural line, which is gonna be right here, hit the M mode button a second time, and what you should expect to see is plural line, like so, or like so, and then below the plural line, you should expect to see kind of a speckled type pattern. If below the plural line, you see a linear pattern, that's very concerning for pneumothorax. So essentially, when you're looking at the MO image, find the plural line, which is gonna be the bright horizontal line about halfway down, and then look below it. If you see a sandy-like speckled pattern, that's good. If you see a linear pattern that looks the same as the top half of the screen, that's concerning for pneumothorax. All right, so in terms of pearls, pitfalls, and tips, Beware that a negative FAST exam in a patient with prior abdominal surgeries may not necessarily be truly negative because fluid may channel to other areas of the abdominal cavity based on adhesions and altered anatomy after they've had their surgery. Also, remember that ultrasound does not differentiate ascites, blood, or urine. Fluid is fluid is fluid is going to look black. It's going to take your own history, physical, and clinical skills to determine what that fluid collection is. And if necessary, then you can always um, tap the fluid and drain it if the clinical context is appropriate. But in the trauma setting, generally, when you see free fluid where it shouldn't be there, you need to assume it's blood. Now, we talked a little bit today about looking for pericardial effusions, and it's important that you also know that epicardial fat, which is normal and generally seen anteriorly, can sometimes be confused with pericardial effusion. So if you look at this video clip, you can see the right ventricle, you can see the pericardium here, and there's a little bit of space between the two. But if you look closely, it's not purely black. It's not anechoic. There's actually some echogenicity there, and it's not a very significant amount, and it's not posterior. And in that scenario, you would give strong consideration to thinking that this might just be a fake out of epicardial fat as opposed to a true pericardial fluid. But again, when in doubt, you can always get a formal study, a CT scan, or do serial ultrasound exams and look to see if the fluid collection is increasing. In this instance, it likely wouldn't be because it's a normal variant with just some epicardial fat there that's very prominent. Lastly, always and gently, subtly redirect your probe to completely examine each structure. That way you avoid misses. You want to be 
uh, thorough with this examination because again, if you have a small amount of fluid, you may not see it at all, even in experienced hands. So in closing, remember the fast exam or the extended fast is a great technique with many applications for a wide variety of blunt trauma victims. The extended fast is simply an expanded exam that includes evaluation of the pleural space. Patient positioning is of utmost importance, yet oftentimes overlooked. So you want to remember to put the patient in Trendelenburg when you're looking in the right and left upper quadrants. Put the patient in reverse Trendelenburg when you're looking in the pelvis, and this will allow you to see smaller amounts of fluid. Remember, the name of the game is you want to be fast, but you also want to be thorough. Here are some of the references used for this presentation. And I'd like to give particular special thanks to Dr. Virag Shah, who uh, contributed significantly to this presentation, got a lot of the video clips, and did many of the anim animations. So thanks very much to Dr. Shah. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me via email or via Twitter. And I look forward to scanning with you in the department or in the simulation lab. Thanks so much for your attention.